join me in our call to worship. Great Spirit, come to us here and now. Come with mighty power. Come with awesome strength. Great Spirit, come into our lives and come here between us. Come so that we may be energized and renewed in your transforming love. Great Spirit, renew us and renew your church. And may our celebration here together be a witness to all the world of God. God's continuing presence in our lives. You may be seated. Good morning. And welcome as we come to worship in this season of Lent. I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you. The ushers are going to hand out Ritual of Friendship cards, and I hope that you will take a moment to fill those out as an act of your worship, whether you're a guest with us this morning or have been here all of your life. I would like to uh, lift up as you take a look through your joy notes is that next weekend begins Holy Week with Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is such a festival day for us filled with celebration and transitioning into the passion of Jesus as we move into Holy Week. There you will find uh, information about the live donkey and the palm processional, about the special music that the chancel choir and others in orchestra are providing, and that it is our commitment weekend that day. There will also be a pancake breakfast sponsored by Mission Guatemala, and so I hope you all will come hungry, and as you uh, invite guests to worship with you, invite them to a share in a wonderful and filling meal downstairs. Again, I welcome you as we come to worship this day, as we continue to reflect on what it means to set sail toward the abundant life.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so we turn to God in a time of silent and listening prayer. In these next few moments, in the air that we share in this sacred space, let us be silent before God and each other. Loving God, as we are sailing away into um, a life of discipleship, as we have been preparing and practicing, as we have been growing and being stretched, as we've allowed you to guide us, we come this morning in prayer to you, prayers of joys that are unspeakable, prayers of concern that are weighing heavy on our chest for people and places and situations in our lives not only for our lives, but for people around the world, in our country, on different continents around this wonderful creation that you have given to us. Especially this morning, we pray for Anita having uh, shoulder surgery on Tuesday. Prayers of help with marriage and family. Prayers for a niece and her family who recently had a miscarriage. Prayers for Virginia Fauber. Prayers for my mother who is having shoulder surgery. Prayers for a friend who is awaiting a transplant. God, we ask that you infuse this time of worship with your presence and allow us to be moved further along. Allow us to be your presence. Allow us to sail away as we serve you, as we serve those who have been placed in our course, in our daily lives, as we pray together the prayer that Christ himself taught us all. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I would like to invite um, our discipleship moment as we um, think about servant witness and the ways that God has called us to practice this spiritual discipline. And so I invite um, Rich Batchelder to come and share a word with us this morning. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, everyone. My charge was to speak from the heart about what does it mean to me to practice the discipline of witness. I have been a member since we moved to Whitefish Bay in the fall of 1987. That was about 28 years ago. This church offers multiple opportunities to witness to each other in so many different ways, such as greeting members and visitors at one of the church doors on Sunday morning with my wife, Susan, and visiting the homebound members by delivering plants or cookies with special cards prepared by some of our children in the Sunday school classes. This means uh, so much to Susan and I as we learn so much about the faith of others in our congregation. We also are very active in reaching out to the community through faith works once a month. I have helped out at the United Methodist Children's Services by organizing clothes, removing wallpaper, and painting apartments. Other months, I have gone to Northcott Neighborhood House to help with the grounds upkeeping in the spring and fall, painting and kitchen cleaning as required. I have also helped with projects around the church by power washing the chairs from Fellowship Hall. You may have seen me out there in July and painting all over the church. Last week, I had an interesting witness event at Northcott Neighborhood House. While I was working alongside with Bill Christ, another member of our congregation, two women walked up to us and said it was good that we were working off hours for our community service requirement. <laughs> Later that morning, another woman came by and thanked several of us for working outside on the spring cleaning. She started to ask us questions as she wanted to start a program up at her church to clean up the area around her church. We chatted a few minutes and gave her ideas that had worked for us in FaithWorks. I was glad to see a spark from what we were doing to pass on the witnessing to someone else in the community in a very positive way. It was interesting to compare the perceptions of these two encounters. Both of these encounters were positive in what we were doing in the community to help. Susan and I attended the, attend the adult Bible study class on Sunday mornings. I enjoy the class as it stimulates my faith. The class has some very interesting discussions how we relate the Bible to our own personal lives. Through these discussions, it motivates me to have a deeper faith and understanding of Jesus Christ. Christ is calling us to be witnesses every day so that people may know our commitment to him. All of my actions on a daily basis are reflections of my witness. I realize I am not perfect and I fall short of being a Christ-centered in my witnessing. This church offers multiple opportunities to witness to each and every one of us. I would encourage you to start attending a small group to help you strengthen your faith and grow in the love of Jesus Christ. These and many other reasons are why Susan and I continue to support our church financially. Finally, your work booklet on setting sail toward abundant living under the witness section, which some of you are attending some of these classes, I only say is trust in the spirit. In God we trust. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, we have an opportunity that God has given to us that we can also be witnesses by the ways that we give through our financial giving, through our tithes, our offerings, especially as we give, um, know that the loose change offering for the month of March goes to our Honduras mission trip, which is um, an ability we have to witness in that country as well as the ways that we witness through our lives. So let us give freely and joyfully before God being a witness to what God has given to us.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all that you have given to us, for our family and friends, for our place here in your church, for the witness that we have of your love and grace. We ask now that you bless these gifts that they may transform us, transform our world, and be a witness to your grace and love, mercy, and peace. For we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. people of God said, Amen. Remember with me as I read the story of witness from the Acts of the Apostles. And then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This was a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? 
And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ezetus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. May the Lord bless to us the reading of this word. Amen. I'll be inside in a minute. I'm going to say hey to Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Mike. Flower beds are looking good, neighbor. Yep. You guys just get back from church? Ah. Yeah, yeah. I just been at the church house. I wonder why he never invites me to church. I mean, I'd go if he asked me to go. This is the way it is. I'm out in my front yard when he comes home from church. It's always so awkward. It's so awkward. And I'm so hungry. Ugh. I think my wife made goulash. I love goulash. Oh, maybe Joe would like some goulash for lunch. Hey, Joe. Here comes the invitation to church. Yeah? You want to come over for a Sure, I'd love to go to church with you. What'd you just say? What'd you just say? No, what? No, what'd you say? What'd no, you what say? What'd you say? You said something about God. 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 Goo. 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 Goulash. 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 It's a. You're having goulash at your church? <laughs> no. No, at my house. You're having. You're inviting me over for goulash. Yeah. At your goulash. Yeah. Who doesn't like goulash? I like <laughs> some goulash. Yeah. Sign me up. Goulash. <laughs> I'll check and make sure we have enough. I see you walking away. As we take a look at the spiritual discipline of witness this morning, sometimes it is awkward to talk about our faith or to invite someone to come to worship with us. I want to tell you a story of uh, just a few years ago when my husband went to some neighbors that were moving into our neighborhood just two doors down from us. And so he went over to uh, introduce himself and uh, welcome them to the neighborhood, and then he uh, invited them to come to church. And the response of uh, the neighbors uh, to him was, we're not those kind of people. Awkward. But indeed, we laugh about it now, and certainly remember the teaching of Jesus when he sent the 70 disciples to go out in the world to proclaim the good news. 
He said, not everyone will be receptive, but in those times, simply just shake the dust off of your feet and continue to move on. I think that's an important message for us as we seek to share what God has done in our life or to invite others to come to the church in a community of faith that is important to us, that we hesitate to do that or feel awkward about that because we don't know what their response will be. But consider these statistics. A few weeks ago, uh, Ryan Duncan sent me an article that said that church attendance was growing in our country. And in fact, when you took a look at the statistics and the map is in the southeastern part of our country, that's where the growth was really happening. But in that study, they went through and they showed percentages for every single state. And it was interesting to take a look at Wisconsin, where 29% of our population attend worship regularly and 45% say they attend seldom or never, but that they would be open to an invitation if somebody offered. I think, think we've moved into a new day and a new age where we come to know that not everyone believes that when they walk into the doors of the church, it will be a place where they are welcome a place where they will be accepted, where somebody will notice that there's someone new and ask them if they can help either with getting their children to Sunday school or their way around. And so needing to make an invitation is one way of witnessing to our faith. And when we reflect upon what it means to witness, and I suspect that that may be a harder um, discipline to practice and talk about even than giving is that we touched upon last week is that we really find that the act of witnessing and the discipline of witnessing excuse me comes from the scriptures i have heard from uh, several people in the congregation who have taken spiritual gifts analysis uh, maybe many of you have done that, where evangelism is one of those spiritual gifts. And when you went through the analysis, evangelism didn't show up as one of your spiritual gifts. And so you said, I don't ever have to do it. And I say, nice try. See, spiritual gifts really highlight the ways in which God has blessed us in very special ways to carry out his ministry in the world. But almost all of the spiritual gifts we can find in Scripture, especially witness or evangelism, as part of a practice of who we are as professing Christians and those who seek to follow Jesus. I have not ever found in any of the Bibles that I own in the beginning of the book a disclaimer that says you may pick and choose what you feel comfortable with and disregard the rest. You see, the story of God's faith in shaping our lives toward the abundant life is to offer us comfort, but there are places in which it is called to make us uncomfortable as we seek to follow Jesus more deeply. And so consider some of these biblical teachings that come from Scripture that that compel us, that Jesus expects us to go out in the world to talk about our faith. He says first to the disciples in the Gospel of John, he said, people will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for others. Or in the book of Acts, when Jesus has been resurrected from the dead before the ascension, he says to the disciples and the others gathered around, he said, you are my witnesses. You are to go to Jerusalem, to your home, to Judea, to the suburbs, to Samaria, a little farther out, and to all the ends of the earth. Or the very last words and teaching that he gave in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, don't just sit still, he says, go. Go out into the world and to teach and baptize in my name, and I will be with you always. 
or simply the model that he gave when he invited some of the men to be those very first disciples when he said to them, come and see. And when they heard and saw and experienced Jesus, they went and told others, and they said, I have seen the Messiah. Come and see for yourself. There are many passages that lead us that faith is something that we receive, that God comes and offers grace and love to us so that we might be changed and respond in our witness to others. It is not only part of the scriptural foundation, but it really is the very foundation of our United Methodist thought. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote a foundational document called The Character of a Methodist. In there, he said that Methodists are people who do good, all the good that they can whenever they can to whomever they can. And as Wesley continued to expound and develop those ideas, he said that we are to do good to respond to people's physical need, but we are to do good to their souls as well. A holistic way as we care for others is to pay attention to their needs, both physically and emotionally and spiritually. And so how might we go about in our witness so that it isn't awkward, that we might find a way to witness in healthy and comfortable ways that this discipline is just a natural part of who we are. I believe we can take a look at our witness through our deeds and our witness through our words. When I think about witness through our deeds in the last couple of weeks, Two of uh, my heroes in the faith have died and entered into eternal life. The first one, Lyle Schaller, is a name you probably recognize. Lyle has been a foremost leader for um, decades in shaping the church and understanding the church and indeed has taught me almost everything that I know. A second uh, person is Fred Craddock, who might be a little less familiar to you, but a number of years ago, Fred Craddock was named the number one preacher in the world. And I suspect that 95% of clergy who have taken a class in preaching have read one of his books. But uh, Fred Craddock was a master at storytelling and had the privilege during my doctoral work that he came uh, for the summer that we were there. And I have this picture of him. He would just simply sit down in a chair and tell stories, and we would all gather around and just be mesmerized. It always felt like it was that modern-day version of the pictures we see of Jesus with the children who were surrounding him. But one of the stories that Fred Craddock told was one of his father. And he said that his relationship with his father was a difficult one, and often these would come out in different stories that he told. That early on in his life, everything seemed to go well with his family. While they weren't rich, they had more than enough. But then his father began drinking, and slowly they lost everything and even the times of going to church. His father one day simply walked away and said he would never come back. He said all the church was interested in was judging him, and all they wanted was his money. But it was a church that young Craddock and his family loved, and it was a church that nurtured them through some very difficult times in their lives. And when he felt the call to ministry, he said that he naively thought that this would be the way in which he could reconcile his father with the church and restore life with his family. But indeed, as he reflects, that he was naive in understanding the power of addiction. Well, early on in his ministry, young Craddock received a call from his mother and said that his father was near death. And so he walked into the hospital room and there saw half the man physically that he remembered the last time he had seen him. The illness had taken a toll on him, 
and his cancer, his body was emaciated with all of the radiation burns from treatments, and his father could no longer talk, and he no longer could eat. And so when he saw his son come into the room, he took a Kleenex box that was there and, and he scribbled some words on it and he wrote some words from Shakespeare's Hamlet. And he said, in this harsh world, through all of the pain, tell my story. Craddock said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, what is the story that you want me to tell? And the older Craddock wrote on the box, I was wrong. See, as he went on, the young Craddock took in all of the rest of that hospital room as well, a room that was filled with plants and with flowers. And he said there was a pile on a stack of cards that must have been 20 inches high next to his bedside. And as his father made his confession, he said, I was wrong. All of those cards and all of those plants came from people from the childhood church. He said, I was wrong that thinking they only wanted to judge me or they wanted my name on the rolls or that they simply wanted my money. Now I know they wanted me. See, our witness indeed is by the ways in which we reach out to others. And for us, it might be very simple gestures but for others can be touched in an incredibly profound way. We also come to witness not only in our deeds, but in our words. And this is a story I want to tell you about Amy Dodge, who is a member of our church, and she's been part of uh, the choir and has just loved it. Amy is um, a young woman about my age, That connection was made later on as I was thinking about this story. But one who has been dealing with stage four breast cancer for the last year. And her doctors say that she is cured from the breast cancer. And indeed, it's an incredible miracle and wonderful news. But the story about Amy isn't so much about her health, but it is a story that I want to tell you about her witness a story that she shared with me one of the days that I went to go visit her in the hospital. And one, as we were talking this week, and I was asking if I had permission to share it and trying to figure out how I could get her to tell it herself, because it would be simply much more moving than my retelling. But Amy, one day when she was going through one of her chemo treatments, was going through one that had been different than in the past. And she said she was a little nervous about going through that treatment. Amy speaks very highly of all of the medical staff who have cared for her and the ways in which they've been amazingly helpful to, to her. But on this day, one of the oncology nurses was noticing that she was a little bit nervous about this treatment. And so she began to talk to her and try to distract her from that which was happening. And finally, she asked her a question that went something like this. She said, what is it that keeps you going? What has given you strength? And Amy said, without thinking for a moment, she said, it was my church. And the nurse was interested to hear more. And so Amy told her about the first time that she and her husband Jim and their son Max walked into the door and what a wonderful experience she had and how people had welcomed her. And this has been her home. She talked about all of the people who have been reaching out with cards and with prayers and with phone calls and on Facebook and told the nurse that she was the most blessed woman that she could ever imagine being. In the midst of the conversation, they found out that each of them had considered themselves to be United Methodists, but then the nurse had said to Amy, she said, oh, I wish that I could say that about a church. She said, I haven't been in church for many years. I left uh, the church because it didn't seem to matter anymore, 
and it didn't seem to matter to the people who were there that I was gone. I wish I had a church that I could feel as good about and feel like it was my second family. And so Amy, without a beat, said to the nurse, she said, I'd love to have you come to our church. And she said, when I'm better, my husband and I would be happy to meet you or pick you up and to bring you here. And the nurse said to her, she said, I sure hope you don't forget. And they exchanged phone numbers. And Amy's looking for the, forward to the time in which she can be back out in public and has enough strength and and invite this young woman to come with them. And I know that when they come and when she walks in the door that she will be welcomed by all of you. Sometimes I think we say that being in the church, we don't know anyone who doesn't have a church home. We don't come across anybody who doesn't practice a faith. But I suspect that as we reflect upon our lives and the patterns of our days, that we come in contact every single day with people who are not connected to a community of faith, who are really struggling with a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives and want desperately to be loved and accepted by God through a community of others. That's why I chose the story today of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. You see, in that beautiful story, part of being able to offer an invitation or sharing our faith comes from allowing the Spirit to guide us and to work through us, to know indeed that it is not ours alone, but a God who is with us every step of the way, and a God who is equally at work at another person as well. In this story, Philip has been led by the Spirit to go down this road to uh, Gaza, and there he notices the Ethiopian eunuch reading. And he doesn't approach the chariot and the Ethiopian and say, here, let me tell you about the four ways to know Jesus. What he says is, what are you reading? He takes an interest and builds a relationship with the Ethiopian who then encourages and continues the conversation and one thing leads to another that Philip is able to share of his faith and they eventually come to a time in which the Ethiopian asks if he could be baptized. You see, for a number of reasons in the story, the Ethiopian eunuch would have always been outside of the faith. He would not have been welcomed in the faith. And now here was an opportunity, an invitation of another who saw a man who took notice and who was able to help him live that abundant life. And so this week as we move through and I offer this invitation to discipleship. I want to ask you to write down three to five names of people that you know that may not have a church home. Maybe it's somebody that you don't even know the name of, but that you encounter every day. And to be able to simply pray about those persons and if the Spirit so leads you to be able to find an opening, to have a conversation, to offer an invitation that simply says, come and see, and to allow the Spirit to work in their lives. For when Jesus said to the disciples, when he said, you are my witnesses, he didn't simply say that to those who he gathered in the first century. He says that to us. Amen.
and then you will come to a page where you will see the six spiritual disciplines that we have been talking about and growing in this year. I want to invite you to prayerfully consider how you want to deepen your walk with Christ and keep that page for yourself. You will then find on the opposite page where the commitment to serving and the commitment to giving pages are, and simply tear those off and then place those in the envelope that is inside of your booklet and bring those with you when you return next week as we make our commitments to Christ and his church together. Now as you go forth on this day, May you be reminded of those words that we call the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go, go out into the world and share the good news of how God is working in your lives. But as you go out into the world filled with joy, may you also go with deep assurance, for Jesus says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so go not alone, but go with him. Amen.